deal for you. I know you've you know you've written many a book, Stanley Howard Ross, but uh, this one feels like it's a little bit special. Do you do you feel that way that there's? Yeah, I feel that um, this is a different kind of book than I normally write. And I don't think it's uh, the difference between academic and non-academic books. I think it's, um, in a way, more personal. Uh, In that way, it's closer to the memoir that I did, Hannah's Child, than, um, than it is some of my other books. Yeah, and and so for people who haven't yet, uh, you know, found their found their way to this book, you, it's a series of letters that you uh, engage a series of letters that you write to your godson, which is right. which is such an interesting concept um, that you would write uh, letters to a, you know, to a a young a young boy uh, from, from well, the time he's born. Well, uh, it, it's Sam Wells' fault. Yeah. Um, when when Sam and Joe Wells, when he was dean of the chapel here, and Joe was head of the Anglican Episcopal House of Studies, uh, they asked me to be one of the godparents when they when Laurie was born, and I said I'm honored to do so, but I'm such a terrible godparent, I never know what to do. I mean, you say you take God seriously or something like that, and um, Sam said, Well, I'll give you an assignment. Every year on the anniversary of his baptism, you are to write uh, commending a virtue to him. And uh, I didn't set out to write them to be a book, but as it evolved, um, it seemed increasingly likely that that might make some sense. So that's how the project uh, happened. And that and that started in uh, two th- in the year two thousand. Is that right? Um, yes. Yeah. And so for seventeen years, you've, you've no fourteen. Fourteen years. Yeah. Well, actually, fifteen altogether. Right. And um, I, I'm so interested for you uh, the process of what that meant for you. And there's one sense in which you're writing to this this young boy, right? And he's an infant, and you know he's not going to read this for years. So you recognize that he's going to be changing over time as he reads this. But over 15 years, Stanley Hauerwas was changing as you were writing this, and your career and your thinking and yourself. Did you feel that as you went back and looked over these letters, that there was an arc of your own transition and change and development for you as a person as much as what you were hoping for, for Lori? I think what I realized as I read back through them is my death was increasingly apparent to me. Uh-huh. <laughs> I I say um, I'm 77. I'm beginning to understand that death is not a theoretical possibility even for me. Yeah. And so I noticed that that was entering into um, some of my uh, reflections that I was writing to Laurie. When you were first given the assignment, uh, hey, write a, write to him a virtue, you know, each each year. That's that's a very I, I know that sort of fits into your way of thinking and your understanding of ethics and and all. But it's an unusual category. How did you decide which virtues you wanted to address in which particular order? Like as you're thinking about I, how he would read these. Yeah, you know, I tried to uh, think about the virtues that were most appropriate to his development. I mean, I started with kindness because uh, children are not kind uh, and they need to be to learn. You don't pull the kitty's tail and that they learn to be kind by the kitty wants to be petted. You don't become virtuous by trying to uh, inculcate the virtue in and of itself. You come to virtue by its writing on the back of certain practices that you discover you cannot live well without. And so in the second year, since I assumed Laurie was beginning to talk, yeah. I thought it, he needed to think about truthfulness. 
Hmm. Because as soon as we learn to talk, we learn to lie. And uh, those are the ways I tried to think through uh, the uh, various virtues I chose in terms of the kind of um, development in his body and in his living that this virtue would appear. Now, you, you started this project in the early 2000s, um, and at that same time in 2001, uh, Time Magazine uh, uh, distinguished you as America's best theologian, which I didn't even know there was a category back in 2001 that no, I, was the I, best. I, I actually, it was the best theologian in America. Best theologian <laughs> in America, okay, with a, with a slight qualification. Uh, that's a that's a bit of a heady thing uh, to to go on. Did, was there any sense that as you were writing to Lori in these in these books that that or in these letters that that was a writing to him? What, did that um, did that feel different to you coming from your own life and heart as opposed to the the public person you were? At, you know, at, at the Duke Divinity no, School. No, or, I never. You know, I just never. I've never taken any of that very seriously. Mm -hmm. I when it, I it's true. Uh, that when uh, our publicity person came to tell me that I was I was named this, yeah. my first response was, "Best is not a theological category." <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if you let uh, uh, the public media determine your uh, existence, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What 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 phrase would you have um, connected to better? What 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 category theological category would you have said? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I've I've worked toward that. He has been a faithful expositor mm. of the Christian gospel. Mm. <laughs> and for you, that that plays out, and I think this is at the heart of the book that that being an expositor of the Christian gospel that plays out in a particular way in your thinking, doesn't it? Like it's not just. It, a... Go ahead. I hope it does. Yeah, I think though there is um, Doug and. In this book, a more explicit understanding of how our natural bodies and passions are begging to be habituated in the virtues. Hmm. And uh, therefore, it's not like um, Christianity is some alien tradition you um, dump on yourself and others, but it is the explication of what it means to be a human being. So you're saying that it's rooted more in the full human experience than it is a, an external demand from a religious right. or cultural system. Right. So that's one of the things I wanted to ask you is, are virtues, uh, like it's such a curious word. I was spending some time looking it up and realizing that it's, it's usage. I don't know if you saw that there's a... Um, uh, a a chart in the Wikipedia description of virtues that shows its diminishing usage since the middle 1800s. It's like a steady, no, I hadn't. It's like a steady downline on how often it's been right. used in publications. So it's an interesting concept that feels like it has um, sort of uh, left the, vern the vernacular. Like people don't think about virtues. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we think about behaviors or character qualities or personal strengths. Yeah, person. Yeah. Right. What do you think? Well, of, what, 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 as you think about a virtue, as you were writing them to, you know, to your godson, uh, what, 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 what do you think is the essence of a virtue versus a, you know, a practice or a temperament or a personal strength? Uh, it's a, uh, uh, in, um, in the ancient Greek re reflections on the virtues, mm -hmm. the virtues are powers that um, provide the possibility of doing what otherwise could not be done. So they would speak of the virtue of a knife in a way that it was sharp and it could cut in the way that knives were supposed to cut. The virtues are not um, impositions from on high, but rather they are um, alternative practices that give us possibilities that we otherwise would not have. Um, 
how you individuate the virtues and how you understand the relation between the virtues is an ongoing uh, discussion. Hmm. Um, the um, the reason I think one of the reasons that the language of virtue and I spent a lifetime trying to have us reflect about the nature of right. the moral life in the, yeah. in the language of the virtues rather than the language of decisions. Hmm. Uh, the, the reason that I think that virtue language has not been as prominent is it requires a communal discernment about what is significant. And that has become increasingly uh, uh, doubtful. It require you say it requires a communal discernment. Yes. Huh. About, uh, I mean, it, it, and that discernment is usually in the form of a narrative that helps us see what is important and what is not important for the living of our lives. You, you know, that's so interesting to, that you put it that way because I guess I have this impression, or when I think of a virtue and a virtuous person. I think of like the image that comes to my mind is the virtuous person is the one that stands apart from the crowd. They're the one with true courage or charity or, or love or value. And they're different from all the rest. And there's a few people that we know in our lives who are virtuous and all the rest of us, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're stuck with our vices. But those virtuous people are different from the rest of us. And you seem to be saying... No, there's something uh, in the, it requires a communal collective engagement for right. a person or a people. Can, can you reflect at all on what, what, where that impression that I have comes from or how you think about that, this sort of? Well, because I think you think of it that way because, in fact, there's a good deal of truth in that description. <laughs> okay. But, but uh, the, um, the very virtues that the person that stands out embody our virtues that are communally discovered. Oh. So it's not like it's an individual achievement. Hmm. Um, they have um, reflected a set of practices correlative to hmm. the story that have shaped our lives. Yeah, some, of, some people just do it better than others. Yeah, I can see that. And, and you know, there's, and I think there's this sense of uh, maybe we do with virtues in our society what we do with kind of superheroes or something, where we create this mentality that we will put that uh, ability off. Uh, somebody will be our proxy, so people will want right. to be in a church community and they'll want the pastor to carry a certain level of, of virtue. So she has to be above reproach. But the rest of us, we don't need to be because I have someone who does, I, I'm part of a community where someone holds that that virtue at its at its highest. And it, it tends to let people off the hook it, with that kind of a, with that kind of a mentality. Do you think virtues are, um, um, and I want to talk about the particular ones that you, you write about to your grandson, but do you think virtues are um, equally achievable for each of us? No. <laughs> I don't. I think how our temperament interacts with uh, certain ways of life means for some people certain ways of living will be more challenging than other ways. Like what, what comes to mind for you about that? What, do you have a specific in mind that Seems really obvious. Um, a shy person may not have the same ability to acquire friends in the way that someone that is more gregarious. Hmm. But if they do acquire friends, they may well do that in a way that is more substantive than those that are just naturally gregarious. Oh, interesting. Like, like the people who are more bent toward that might um, have a have a easier time gaining that virtue, but a less uh, deeply uh, held impact of that virtue, huh? Right. Yeah. You you have been um, 
described both uh, in the book and in the promotion around the book and sort of in your life as a as a famously gruff, salty person. And um, and there's uh, even an introduction that Samuel Wells, who's the father of the of Laura, right. who, who you write the book to, says um, it's kind of an interesting thing that Stanley starts with kindness because he's not always he's he's often asked how can you how can your gruff personality match uh, uh, you, you know it, it doesn't seem to match the impression people have of kindness um, and and I think you do something really important with that around you know the kindness is not just interpersonal sentimentality or uh, can, can you talk a bit about that about the difference between a um, uh, the real, that heart of a virtue versus the, the, the sort of initial impression that people have of, of what the virtue would look like. Um, I, um, again, that in, entails a kind of narrative display hmm. of which certain exemplars become constitutive of the narrative. So, um, the um, example engages a kind of reflection mm -hmm. that helps us see more clearly how truth or kindness works. I, I tell the story, for example, I think uh, about Frank Lloyd Wright, who um, was being sued because one of the houses he designed leaked. And uh, when he was put on the witness stand, he was asked, would you please identify yourself? And he said, I'm Frank Lloyd Wright, the world's greatest architect. <laughs> and when he, when he got back to his lawyer's table, his lawyer said, oh, Mr. Wright, could you have refrained from that identification? It just turns the jury's teeth on edge. And Wright said, what can I do? I was under oath. <laughs> no, I, I, I give that as an example of humility. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so uh, those are the kinds of examples that help us um, not let uh, sentimentality determine uh, what, what a virtue looks like. So... So one of the ways that you you describe um, grasping a virtue is to not let it fall into some version of, of populist sentimentality, and and the other is um, to see that a virtue has on the other side of it a particular vice. Uh, is that right? Do, do you see it that way? That's, That's right. Virtue on one That's side, right. vice on the other. Um, th there has been a lot of conversation in society and culture, and it's happening a lot now that. Um, there's a, a sense of morality sometimes that comes from particular people or th ways of thinking that turn um, a certain uh, turn certain behaviors or actions into vices, and they really ought not be. And there's a debate, you know, an argument about what what really is a virtue. And so, like one of the classic virtues is a kind of chastity, right? Sort of a sexual chastity. And there's a lot of people who have felt that the demand, the cultural or communal demand for, for, for chastity has really created a kind of repression and a kind of secrecy and a kind of dominance power of that desire and passion because it's put off as a vice um, and that we need to approach it. Um, more honestly or more openly. And I hear the same thing about issues of anger. Like, hey, if we keep holding down our anger, we're going to, um, you know, it's going to come out sideways. So I think that what I'm getting is there's this big debate about um, what, what classifies as a vice or not. It doesn't feel like there's as much of a debate, maybe among theologians and ethicists and moralists, about what is a virtue. But, but the argument feels like it's on the other side about what is a vice, um, yeah, that's um, that, that's a set of really interesting uh, comments. I um, um, there's there is there is no virtue that isn't open to uh, perversion. There is the um, the vice. Um, 
um, is one of the ways of naming that. Um, if you take uh, if you take courage, um, some people can think they are courageous because they literally have no fear at all. Uh-huh. If they have no fear at all, interestingly enough, they're not courageous. I see. Yeah. They're just foolhardy. Right. Now, how you make these kinds of discrimination mm-hmm. is um, the way porcupines make love very carefully. <laughs> and um, I'm going to Google that, that later for means, a video image of that. I'm sorry. I'm going to Google a video a, a video of how porcupines make love <laughs> later. <Thanks. laughs> but um, the um, but the discrimination necessary to um, make these kinds of judgments about devices depend on practical reason as an ongoing activity that's never finished. So, I mean, someone may be chased because they have a deficient libido, Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible for their for chastity to be a form of faithfulness to themselves and to the community in which they live as a way of gesturing the kind of lives we need to live as Christians that free us from being sexual predators. Hmm. Yeah, that's so I re- I'm really picking up this um, sense that the, while, while there are um, maybe a bit of a standard set of, of virtues, and they need to be communally held and taught. The personal interaction with those in your thinking is equally as important, that, that sure. the, the particular human being, as they're living in a time and a space um, in their own life, in their own development, that's equally as powerful in the application and the understanding of a virtue. Right. But that makes possible the acquisition of habits. I mean, the virtues are habits. Hmm. That, uh, And the way to think of these kinds of habits is they're skills. They're not just stimulus response. They're skills that hmm. um, will appear differently in different contexts. And did you try to, um, when, when you were writing to, to Laurie, your, your, grand, uh, your godson in this, in this book, um, in these letters, uh, were, were you highly conscious of that of that part, the the personal side and the skill development side? Is that is that what you are? Um, I, I hope I was. Yeah, <laughs> and I tried to give examples, sure. you know, throughout. Yeah, because um, it, it's um, you, you you have a, a, a interesting comment where you say that you know Aristotle said that the uh, a child and a and a elderly person can't become true friends because their lives are so different. And you say, I, I hope that's not true. Um, that, but boy, it just feels to people like um, their own experience or the, the cultural setting they're in or what it means to be 15 years old and you know, 2015 can seem so different than what it, what it has felt like at other times and what the pressures are. But, but yeah, you're, you're, I'm afraid that our social world is um, uh, possessed by a kind of narcissism that uh-huh. threatens all our lives. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well how, how, what, when you say that a, a kind of narcissism, do, do you mean um, that people only think about themselves, or are you saying that there's a sort of a societal uh, misappropriated virtue that says it's all about you? Like, is it a person breaking from the cultural demand to only worry about themselves? Or are you saying, well, there's a whole societal um, coaching and, uh, and nurturing? More the latter. Yeah. More the latter. But um, the, um, the narcissist um, um, has um, the uh, tendency to um, not know 
they're narcissistic. <laughs> right. So um, they um, uh, 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 they are um, a great threat to themselves and everyone else around them. Mm-hmm. Your conversation about virtue is is uh, particularly Christian. Like a lot, every religion that I know of. Uh, advocates for virtues, different cultural perspectives over time, different philosophers and, and so on have, have, um, have their own set and list of virtues. What's particular about your Christian view when it comes to virtues? And, and how, does that, how does that play out in what you're writing to Lori? Um, the virtues, finally, must be given coherence hmm. by becoming conditions to be a follower of Christ. And that um, uh, is no uh, mean feat mm-hmm. um, because it will, for example, determine what it means to live a life that is free of deception. And that's a hard and demanding way of life. And I think it's constitutive of what it means to be a Christian. Can, can you say a few more sentences about that? What, um, what is it about, the, about deception that's so powerful for you and rooted in, rooted in, that, in that story? Uh, um, because uh, give us an illusion any time it's preferable to the acknowledgement that our lives are possessed by sin in a way we cannot will our way free of. And uh, that is clearly a Christian mm-hmm. presumption that not everyone shares. What is the way free? What is the way free? Yeah. If you're not the way, will free, your way free. You don't will your way free. You discover you have a friend that will give you an alternative way of mm-hmm. living. Mm-hmm. The, will, the idea that you will your way free is to only invite the kind of narcissism that we were talking of. So you're saying that, that that's going to be found in another, the, the, the yes, pathway right. for you is going to be found in the life of another. Right. Man, that, that, that really raises the, the um, significance of how lonely people in, at least in the United States, feel. Like I, number- I say that the great um, uh, problem of contemporary America is the loneliness that people feel. And the loneliness that people feel derives from the presumption that we are our own creators. Uh, my, My way of putting it is that we live in a world in which people believe they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story. And that's called freedom. Difficulty with that story is you didn't choose it. <laughs> so um, Americans now find themselves fated to be lonely, and they call it freedom. One of the ways that the, that Christianity has tried to advocate for um, an embodied, lived set of virtues in a people is to do that through the organizing of church communities, right? And so churches are one of the primary experiments that Christian people have, have endeavored on to try to, to try to do this. And in the time that right, right now, and maybe over the last hundred years, um, churches haven't fared very well and they haven't fared very well, both institutionally and they're not very highly thought of. I mean, I pastor one and I'm fully a part of one. So I, I get this, right. that sometimes, you know, for some of us, they really do work. But on the whole, 
um, if churches are not going to be the places where the community forms to find this way of, and path of life that's inside of humanity and to find the way for it to, to manifest in someone in virtues uh, and faith, where, where can that happen if in, in the way that you're thinking about the world? If we don't have those collectives of people, um, where, where do people find this? The army. Really? I mean, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I, I admire. Of all the, the words I right? thought you might say, army was not on the list. <laughs> oh, the army is terrific. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I have, uh, the Marines are better. Oh my God. Um, um, but, wow. um, <laughs> but my, my way of putting it is no Jews, no Jesus. No Jesus, no church. And there is no Christianity without the church. And that just is uh, the bottom line. So, uh, so if, 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 um, if, if churches are, are, are what you mean by the church the same as churches? Or like uh, the congregation, yes. you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a congregational Catholic. Uh huh. Um, and um, uh, if I, I, there's no, there's no uh, Christianity on your own. Hmm. I mean, I mean, you get Americans saying things like. I believe Jesus is my personal savior. He's Lord of history, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I say stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So, uh, so if most people are not engaged in anything that would resemble that kind of a gathered congregation, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of the broad, of the broad Christians, doesn't that imply that the sense of Christian virtues will only be as available as the number of people who are engaged in that particular way of living and being? Yes. Yes. So you're really, a, I mean, well, there's a sense in which you're, you're, you're a church, ad, a church uh, thriving advocate in order for these absolutely. virtues to play out. Huh? Absolutely. Hmm. And um, that, um, you know, I, the the most antagonistic way to put it is outside the church there's no salvation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, a less ab, uh, antagonistic way to put it is without the church there's no salvation. Mm -hmm. So that makes you think what you mean by salvation. Mm -hmm. and what you should mean by salvation is you've been made part of a body of people who are an alternative to the world's fears. Yeah. And, and I guess it also invokes the question: What what does it mean to be um, part of a, a church or part of the church? In the way of thinking. Yes. So if someone has a, <clears throat> uh, they they uh, engage in some of the practices some of the time. They listen to a f talks. They have a collection of books in their uh, library. They um, talk with their friends. They they kind of pray on their own. You know, they sort of do it yourself with the instruction yeah. and no, picture no do it yourself christianity <laughs> yeah we 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 uh, we're um we're a faith that we uh, have by being handed on from another mm -hmm. i've really enjoyed this i just have had friends come in as an appointment oh that's fantastic well i'm, I'm glad you have uh, uh, uh a chance for this conversation stanley i really appreciate it the book is called the character of virtue: Letters to a Godson. Uh, it's the. Right. It's not a kids' book, but in a lot of ways, it's a children's book. So it's fantastic. I hope so. Yeah, Stanley. Thank you and congratulations. Oh, well, thank you very much, Doug. It's lovely to meet you. Yeah. Bye bye now. Take care. Bye bye. Well, how you doing? Well, there you go, everybody. How about that? Um, normally, I do these um, live streams for my podcast via Zoom. But um, Stanley and I did it by phone. That's why his picture's up there. Well, that was a trip. That, that, 
that whole thing. I'm a, I, I've thought a lot about that. If um, that's how that goes, this thing about the church, this thing about the necessity of it. I don't know. Interested in your thoughts. So if you have those, I don't know. Let me know. All right. Peace out, as the kids used to say.